Good afternoon, guys. Uh, thanks for having me over here. My name is Gotham Rao. Um, Gu is my uh, nickname. I'm with Portworx. I'm the CTO at Portworx. And uh, I've actually had the pleasure of um, you know, presenting to some of you guys before uh, back at Oak Arena. So uh, friendly faces, and we'll try and keep it interactive. Um, and also, at one point, I will try and show you where you can download the software. So if anybody over here wants to do that real time, I know we did that at uh, Oak Arena, so certainly um, so something we can do here as well. Um, before I get started, a little bit of uh, background on the company. Portworx is a startup that was uh, founded in uh, 2015. Um, some of you know Murley, who is our CEO. Um, he was the CEO uh, at Oak Arena as well. Um, Myself, um, I'm the CTO. Uh, prior to this, I was the CTO at, uh, for the data protection group at Dell. Um, Dell acquired a company um, that we had started called Oak Arena Networks, which focused on uh, scale-out storage optimization. Um, and then Eric Hahn, who's our VP of product, comes to us from uh, Google. He was one of the co-creators of the Google Compute Engine, Kubernetes. Um, so, as a team, we have uh, we're sort of, we have a lot of talent just focused on solving this uh, stateful um, persistence problem for containers. People deploying applications like databases and containers. And I'll spend some time talking about what those problems are and how um, that's solved. Um, we uh, just closed our Series B. Um, we made a press release last week uh, or two weeks ago on that with, uh, from Sapphire Ventures. Um, we have um, additional investment from General Electric, who is one of our larger customers. Um, in this demo, I want to sort of keep our presentation, uh, keep it uh, specific to the use cases, um, and, and I'll sort of talk about uh, what, what customers are doing so you can see um, how this, um, uh, this technology so solves the problem for them. Um, just an executive summary over here. Um, uh, we're all here um, at DockerCon because obviously we all believe DevOps has been and is continuing to go mainstream. And I'll explain what that means. But we are, as an industry, seeing uh, enterprises of all um, shapes and sizes um, uh, embrace uh, DevOps to gain that agility. Uh, contrast this with uh, the traditional IT model where you have a ticket in the process and the IT department is siloed. Um, essentially, what's driving um, the technology behind uh, Portworks, it's the need for people to have that cloud-native experience. In an ideal world, people would want everything to work sort of like it works in AWS, and you really don't have to uh, worry about who's managing your state, and you've uh, 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 you know, basically outsourced the problem to somebody else. And that gives you maximum agility. And as these enterprises are trying to recreate that for their internal DevOps teams, um, they run into problems. And I'll articulate what those problems are. And, what, and, and um, uh, essentially, at a 10,000-foot level before I get into it, um, technologies like Docker make it very easy for developers to, in a developer-oriented way, to package their software and have it deployed. And using schedulers like Kubernetes and Mesosphere or Swarm, you have a cloud-agnostic compute experience. And what Portworks provides is a cloud agnostic storage experience. So essentially provides a common denominator platform to which you can build and craft your applications. Um, as your DevOps teams are deploying their applications, they don't, have to be, they don't have to worry about whether it's sitting in AWS and how do I manage EBS volumes, or if it's sitting in Google Compute, how do I manage persistent disks. It's a layer that provides that agnostic experience. So you're writing to a common denominator platform. Um, essentially, what's happening in the industry is we're seeing a shift from um, fixed, uh, you know, old school, um, uh, traditional SAN and NAS type of solutions or things based on virtual machines to what we call cloud uh, native infrastructure. And there's a number of ways to parse the, uh, the picture on the right hand side. But what we see as building blocks in building cloud native infrastructure includes some sort of minimalistic OS. Um, obviously, containers are becoming the tool of choice to package your applications. Um, as a software industry, we've uh, sort of matured. We no longer write monolithic application stacks that can be packaged in a VM and deployed and managed as a VM. I'm a developer. I don't think machine-centric. I think application-centric. I think service-centric. So containers make sense. 
to package applications like that as opposed to using Chef and Puppet to deploy applications. And then having a um, uh, cloud um, native or cloud um, uh, ready scheduler such as Kubernetes or Mesosphere or Swarm to be able to deploy the compute uh, portion of the task fluidly across any cloud or any data center. Um, th these are some of the building blocks. And what Portworx provides is, like I mentioned, that cloud native storage layer. Under the hood, Portworx is a software defined storage solution, but that's only a part of what we do. More of what Portworx provides is that programmatic experience to the end users, to the DevOps teams that are deploying their applications. The specific problem we solve is this. Um, everything, everything is fine until state gets involved. So here's um, an example application of where I'm deploying uh, the standard three-tiered application with uh, some logic running uh, my uh, uh, an Nginx, which is talking over a well-known protocol, maybe restfully to some piece of business logic that I'm running in a Python container, and the blue boxes denote containers, talking over SQL to my SQL. Now, everything is fine, and I can deploy this. I don't have to worry about which cloud I'm running on or how my data center looks or where the uh, compute and storage is coming from if I'm running uh, in my own data center until storage has to be provisioned. And that has always been the problem that draws the, that brings the agility down back to zero. If everything is stateless, you can move fast, you can iterate fast, you can keep changing your applications fast, you don't have any out of band provisioning that needs to be done. But when storage is involved, all of that goes away. Somebody has to think about where is the storage going to come from? How do I make it available to the application? Which server is the application running on? How much storage is needed? How do I make any kind of ads, moves, or changes? And that's the problem that Portworks is squarely aimed at solving. And if you think about the problem statement a little bit more, the core problem is this. Applications don't want LUNs or volumes. The notion of a storage LUN historically has been to provide storage to a machine, to a virtual machine or to a host, to an OS. Nobody ever thought when they wrote their application that where is my, what LUN is my storage going to come from? That's not how we write applications. We expect some uh, persistent storage service to be able to provide that to us. In the traditional world, that used to be a human operator who would go in and make that LUN available to a machine from which, from the host OS, you would carve out a directory, consume it by your application, and if you wanted to make changes, it's a host level change or a backend um, admin level change. But in this new world where we deploy applications using containers and people think in terms of services, it just doesn't make sense to try and manage an external physical volume and wire that into an application running in a container. That's where most of the people run into problems. And um, you have to continue uh, to think along the service-oriented model. That's where this model breaks down. What Portwork solves is exactly that. We provide stateful services, storage services to containers, um, and we are scheduler aware. And so in this model, if you go back to that um, previous example of where I was deploying this three-tiered application, Portworx is just another part of your application stack. Portworx runs inside of a container itself, so it can be deployed via your orchestration, via your scheduler, via um, uh, Mesosphere, via uh, Kubernetes. Portworx, what it does, is it takes the underlying physical resources, whether it's running in cloud and data is coming off of EBS volumes or whether it's running on your data center and data is coming off of a SAN. Or at Portworx, what it does is it neutralizes that environment. It then provides a layer, a virtual layer, from which virtual storage services, volumes, namespaces, S3 type of interfaces are derived from Portworx and provisioned into the application. In this sense, as a DevOps team, you continue to think of this entire stack as part of your application stack that can live anywhere, can be deployed anywhere, and most importantly, you don't have to worry about how this application stack, now with this extension of Portworx, how is it going to run in AWS? How is it going to run in my uh, virtual machine uh, environment? How is it going to run uh, on-prem with bare metal servers? You no longer have to worry about that. You no longer have to tinker with the infrastructure environment, and you can con concentrate on how you want to make ads, moves, and changes to your application stack. Essentially, what Portworx does is it, it allows your DevOps teams to continue that uh, train of thought, that, pro that way of uh, provisioning applications in a service-oriented model, in a container model, through your orchestration environment, and not have any out-of-band provisioning um, happen. Got a question. Yeah. <clears throat> um, this time last year when I was here, 
Um, I went to the presentation given by Joyant, um, and they were talking about how you deal with storage. And one of the things they said was that you shouldn't have any sto uh, persistent storage at all, that you should let the application replicate or copy or do whatever. And if, it, if an instance fails, then it fails. Now, I must admit at the time I thought that was a pretty stupid um, <laughs> approach because clearly you know, we know from history where we are. That in terms of talking to the customers you've talked to, do you think their mentality has changed since we started talking about it? That's a great question. And <clears throat> so in the uh, like extreme way Joy and put it, I, I uh, don't think that that's how customers think. But there's some element to what they're trying to say over there. And there's two things to separate over here. One is application level replication for the purpose of application scaling. So some application, Cassandra, you would want to probably replicate it, not necessarily only for high availability, but maybe because having two or three instances allow your client stack, the end users of Cassandra, to be able to scale better. It's written in Java, it's not the most performant, so have more instances of it. We encourage people to do that. However, Cassandra still needs storage from somewhere. This notion of everything is ephemeral just doesn't make sense. Somebody still has to provide the physical devices, whether it's EBS volumes or if you're running on-prem, the SSDs and the HDD tiers to Cassandra. And then Cassandra does fail too. Again, Java, it runs out of memory, the, node go, the, the server may not go down, but more likely the application's crashing and it's gonna get rescheduled somewhere else. And, you, and the operators have to think about whether they want to resort to application level, higher level resyncing, or if the storage fabric under the hood is faster and more resilient to be able to prov provision the volume ahead of time. So we have great best practices with Cassandra and people don't turn replication off on Cassandra but they may reduce it and increase or have Portworx provide an additional level of resiliency so that when a failure happens it can recover but they still have additional uh, Cassandra level replication so that they can control how their applications scale. It's not an either or but these are essentially the type of problems that people run into. The other one that I want to mention over here is one of density. In the joints way of thinking, they would prefer pinning Cassandra to a physical machine. And I'll tell you, 0.0% of the population thinks that way. People have beefier servers. The Intel in the, of the, the ecosystem has really evolved. It is not possible for me to go in and get a non-beefy server. If I get a server, it has a lot of cores, it has a lot of memory, and has a lot of storage. So I would want to double up two Cassandra instances from different rings on the same system. This is not possible with that fixed way of I'm going to pin a Cassandra to a uh, node mentality. And this is what gives the operators that agility of saying, I'm gonna throw servers at the problem and I'm gonna throw a scheduler at the problem and let things naturally um, um, you know, uh, conform itself to what the physical infrastructure looks like. You wanna have that, um, uh, removing that uh, physical binding from the application to the server or disk is very important. Um, what I want to do is actually show a few demos. Um, and uh, uh, just before I show the demo, I just want to uh, level set what Portworx is. Portworx is an enterprise grade software defined storage solution. Um, I know some of you may have questions in your mind about how this differs from Ceph, and I will address exactly that after I show the demo. We get that question all the time. There's uh, obviously similarities there. Um, if you've played with Ceph, you probably uh, don't have that question. <laughs> Um, the uh, Portworx does provide all of the features like um, uh, replication, encryption, but I want to mention here that Portworx's features are container granular and scheduler aware, and that's key. What that means is, take an extreme example, if you only had one disk, you could run three different um, n, n, n number of containers on it, each would get their own view of the disk, a virtual, they get a virtual volume, a virtual device. And any um, uh, class of scheduling, that, uh, class of service scheduling that's happening or encryption that's happening is all container granular. So in other words, there's no global encryption for the disk. You can have three different containers encrypted with three different keys all sitting on the same drive. Um, and uh, the benefit of doing this is as you move this uh, or replicate this volume from say, uh, uh, let's say you're running in Amazon from region A to region B, zone A to zone B, or even from one cloud to another, um, you're not decrypting and recrypting. It's uh, all uh, singly encrypted end-to-end uh, -end throughout the life cycle of the uh, application's data.